Hi, good morning, everyone, and a happy new year to you. I am so excited to be here. The last time I spoke was about four months ago um, before I went for surgery, and since then, I have not spoken. So today is my first time on the first weekend of the new year. So happy new year and welcome. <laughs> All right, yes, you can clap. <laughs> it's great to be back, isn't it? Now, I just want to say thank you to the media team uh, for sharing my book. Um, Dream Brave is going to be launched at the end of this month, and I hope it will be a blessing. You can pre-order through this link from FaithWorks. And my hope is that each and every one of you who reads the book will be blessed by what God has to speak to us about the dreams His place in our hearts. Shall we just bow our heads and pray before we begin? Thank you, Lord. Father, we just want to thank you for this morning. And even as we gather together at the start, at the cusp of a new year, may your Holy Spirit reach deep into our heart and speak the message that you want to be sowed in our hearts. Revive our buried dreams, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Today, the title of my message is this, When I Don't Understand God. Now, at the beginning of the new year, of a new year, I'm sure many of us have goals and dreams and resolutions. But the funny thing is this, sometimes it can be a time of difficulty for us to look back on the year and say, wow God, it's at the start of 2024 and still I'm like this. I am still single, I still struggle with this baggage, I still have this health condition, my friends and my families are still not saved. There are all these different kinds of things that we bring forward into the new year. And what happens when you don't understand God? So today, I want to begin by reading the first, um, the first book of the Bible, and it's called from Genesis 12, 1 to 3. The Lord had said to Abram, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on the earth will be blessed through you. Wow, friends, do you remember this story when God spoke to Abraham and gave him this vision, this amazing vision? And what happened shortly after that? At the start of a new year, you might find that you're at the beginning. You're reflecting, you're thinking about what God wants to do through you, and you receive these downloads, these visions about what God wants to do in the next chapter of your life. And guess what? Sometimes, that's exactly when life goes out of control. Because guess what happens in a number of chapters down in Genesis 22? This is what happens next. This is what happens next. Okay, it's not. Okay. Now, sometime later, God tested Abraham and he said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Then God said, take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain I will show you. Friends, we are not unfamiliar with this passage. And we all hear time and again of how God emphasized, take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac. And remember, friends, Abraham had waited years and years with Sarah for this promised child. And the sad thing was this that the child never came. They waited and waited and eventually they made their own plans and that's how Ishmael was born through Hagar. But guess what? When Isaac was finally born, he was the key to the vision being fulfilled. And now what's happening? God is asking him to kill his one and only son. It doesn't make sense. What is God doing? Let's read on, verse 3. Okay, the clicker is not working so well, so I need the media team to kind of help me along, eh? Next slide. Now, early the next morning, Abraham got up and loaded his donkey, and he took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. And when he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place that God had told him about. And on the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance, and he said to his servants, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship, and then we will come back to you. Friends, do you notice that, look at verse 4, on the third day. This means that Abraham got up, he got his donkey, he got his servants, he got his son, he's got all these different things prepared for a three-day journey. And I'm not sure about you, I want you to just take a moment right now to think about something really important to you. 
Think about this, whether it's your schoolwork, whether it's your job, whether it's a family member, a ministry, whatever it is, think about something that's dear to you, a hobby even. And if God said, go on this journey and I want you to kill it, destroy it, and you had to go through three days of this agonizing journey, I don't know about you, but I'm probably going to turn back halfway. I'm thinking, what is God doing? I don't understand. But most of all, it is the pain that I have to carry. And that is what Abraham had to do. And I, mind you, remember this. Isaac, unlike many of us who might have first read and thought he might have been a baby, he wasn't. Many commentaries say that he might have been about 10 years old, old enough to carry the wood that Abraham had carried along with them. Let's go on to the next slide. Now, Genesis 22, verse 6. Abraham took the, word for the bu- took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac, and then he himself carried the fire and the knife. As the two of them went together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father Abraham, Father? Yes, my son, Abraham replied. The fire and wood are here, Isaac said, but where is the lamp for the burnt offering? You know, when I read this, I think about this, when Isaac, his own son, asked Abraham, Dad, where, what, what is happening? Where is the burnt offering? I'm just thinking, what did Abraham think about God? God, you promised this vision, right? Isn't this the promised child? What is happening? Let's go on to the next verse. Verse 8. Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. Friends, where did Abraham get this faith from? Was he lying to Isaac? Because in his heart, he had faith that God would still do what he promised. If you read on, you see, and the two of them went on together, and when they reached the place God had told him about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac. This is a 10-year-old boy, my friends. It's not a baby. And laid him on the altar on top of the wood. And then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. Friends, when I looked up, you know, um, on the in, like, you know, when I just Googled, you know, what this picture might look like. You have different kinds of imageries of Abraham hold, closing the eyes of his 10-year-old son and holding up a knife. And those of you who have children, just think about that for a moment. How difficult it was for Abraham to actually put that knife to his son. But don't even think about your children. Think about the thing that you love. Remember I asked you before, think about the thing that you love. Whether it's a hobby, your work, your ministry, anything. And God is saying, would you slay it for me? But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Let's go to the next slide. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything from, to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Abraham looked up and there in a thicket he saw a ram caught by his horns. Now let me tell you this, Abraham was not expecting a ram. I know in the previous slide, we, you read that Abraham was saying, you know, God will provide the sacrifice. But the truth is this, if you read in Hebrews 11, it tells you that Abraham believed that God would resurrect his son from the dead. It means this, it means he did not just think, oh, if I just show God that I'm willing to sacrifice, God's going to save my son. No, it wasn't a cop-out, it was genuine. And then Abraham looked up, and then in the thicket, he saw a ram caught by his horns. He went over, took the ram, sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. And so Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide. And to this day, it is said, on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. Friends, at this point, I want to share my journey with you over the past four months. The last time I spoke, it was at this place as well. And shortly after, my last sermon was about me scheduled for surgery in my spine through my neck. At that time, I did not understand what God was doing to me. At that time, I thought I was at the peak of the year. Everything was going well. My work was going well. Ministry was going well. I had so many plans. You know, Cliff and I were thinking about, you know, relocating to Tanzania with our kids for missions. There were so many things that were rising up. And we thought, we're walking in the will of God. I had a great life. In the mornings at 6 a.m., I would go to the gym. I would, you know, be able to cook for my kids because I had this work from home thing. I felt like I was in a really good rhythm of serving God and living my life. And then suddenly, I had this very unusual pain on, on one particular part of my tricep. 
And that pain just wouldn't go away and I bore with it for months and months thinking that if I rested it, the muscular pain would go away and it never did. And it came to a point one day where I realised I had difficulty typing, even on my phone. It came to a point where I realised that I could not turn naturally. And by the time I went to the neurosurgeon, when he saw my MRI, he said, have, how long have you been living with this? And I said, the first time I felt like I lost sensation of both my hands was almost a year ago. And he said, how can you have been living with this for so long? And friends, the thing is this, when that happened, I realized that God was putting a pause on my life. And I said, God, what are you doing? What is it exactly that you are speaking to me? Because that part of my spine which was affected was C5 and C6. And that particular level of the spine controls my fingers, my right hand, which allows me to type, which allows me to cook, and allows me to exercise. And these three things were what the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, Waija, these three things are exactly the things you have tied your identity to. Your work, represented by typing. Your identity as a mother and a wife, represented by my love to cook. And the last one, exercise. I had developed such a discipline, so-called a discipline, to do these things to the point where God was saying, who takes priority? And if I ask you to lay it down, if I took these things away from you, would you still worship me? And I was frightened because when I went to see the neurosurgeon, I found out that there are some cases which are so severe that the pain never goes away, even after surgery. So I went for surgery with people congratulating me, saying, well done, you're going to come out of it fantastic. And there are many patients who go for this op and the next day they feel so much better. And I was not one of those patients. I struggled with the pain every single day for the next two months and a half. And I told the Lord, Lord, this is unbearable. And it wasn't just the, the pain that was killing me. It was that, God, I don't know when this is going to end. And still, I felt the Lord's still small voice telling me, Waija, I want you to lay it down. This is an inner work I am doing in you. And then he brought to my mind this passage about Abraham laying down his son Isaac. And then he brought to my mind a vision that he had given me a year ago. On the 7th of September last year, I was scheduled for the spine surgery, but a year before that, in 2022, I had gone for the Cornerstone WOW Women's Conference here at Katong. And what happened then was that on that very day, the Lord met me. You see, two days before that, I cried out to the Lord. You see, I have, I have young children, those of you who know me. And my three-year-old at the time, she was trying to mimic me preach. So she went around the house. We have this mic stand, right? And then she did this. She was like holding the mic. And then she said, Mommy, look, look at me. And I'm like, what are you doing? And she says, Mommy, I'm preaching. And when I looked at her, tears welled up in my eyes because she was standing like this and she was preaching like this. And I realized that, wow, all my life I have walked with a terrible slouch. And at that moment, I realized that it was tied to a very specific event I could remember in my childhood that led me to carry the burden of shame over my life. All these years, I've told myself, you know what, Waija, you can stand straight. You can do it. If you exercise, if you do the right things, you know, you just develop self-confidence, you can stand straight. But I couldn't. And on that Tuesday, I'm, I told the Lord privately. I didn't even tell Cliff. I told the Lord, Lord, only you can straighten my back. I told him that. And on Thursday, when I went to the WOW conference, nobody knew what I had told the Lord. And the speaker, it was Heidi Baker, her PA came to pray for me at the altar and she said this, I don't know what this means to you. As I'm praying for you, I see, I see you crouched up like a ball. And the next moment, I see you standing tall with a sword in your hand. And friends, when I went through surgery, all I could think about was that vision. Because the Lord was faithful. He had given me a vision as He had given to Abraham. But remember this, friends. When God gives you a vision... Therein comes the sacrifice and the laying down. When you think about dreaming big or dreaming brave for God, the world's going to tell you, dream brave and ask God to help you. No, that is not my message today. 
My message to you is this, friends, if you want to ask God to help you dream His dreams, if you want to ask God to give you His vision for your life, you better be prepared that He's going to ask us to lay down some difficult things in our lives. Amen? Amen. Let's read on. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. This is Hebrews 11. This is proof of Abraham's faith. And he who had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said, in Isaac your seed shall be called, concluding that God was able to raise him up, even from the dead, from which he also received him in a figurative sense. You see, God was faithful. But at the same time, Abraham believed that God would actually raise Isaac up from the dead. Which means, you see, it's not just about us. Oh, you know, God, I, I consecrate my desire to you to, to, to be attached or to get this job or to be in, in this way in ministry or to excel in this. It's not just about lip service. It's about the actual killing and destroying of it. And in those months, when I had difficulty typing text messages, even on social media, even typing for work, when I realized that I wasn't in a position or fit to speak, I realized that, wow, all of these things were so important to me. Even exercise. And then in the hospital, I was reading Timothy Keller's Counterfeit Gods. And I realized this, that my friends, idols, idols are not things that are like outrightly flat out bad, you know? Those are idols that are very easy to spot. Things like gambling or alcoholism. But idols can be far more insidious than that. Idols are actually good things turn bad. Good things. What are the good things in your life? You could be a worship leader. You could be a cell group leader. You could be someone who works. In the office, you could be a stay-at-home mom, whatever it is that you feel pride in. Friends, that can be an idol. And I sense God calling us today to say, God, whatever our idols are, we lay it down before you. Because you are the one thing that I need. We don't need anything else. We don't need anyone else. Amen? Now, this is what Tim Keller says. God was putting Abraham through the furnace so his love for God could finally come forth as pure gold. You know, when I was in hospital and I read this book, I told myself, God, why are you doing this to me? Then I read this and it suddenly made sense. You see, it's not hard to see why God was using Isaac as the means for this. If God had not intervened, listen, listen to this, Abraham would have certainly come to love his son more than anything in the world if he did not already do so. And that would have been idolatry. And all idolatry is destructive. Wow. Friends, at that moment, my eyes were opened and I saw what I thought to be a curse in my life, to be a blessing. That God, in His grace and mercy, put a stop to all the success I was reaping through what I had placed my identity on. My speaking, my work, my exercising, my being a, being a wife and a mother. And God was saying, I need you to come to know that you are able to let this go and still love me. So friends, there are those of you here today who are struggling with what God has been doing or has done to you in your life. And maybe you don't understand what God is doing. And I want to just reassure you and encourage you that God is still a good God. And He loves you. He loves you. Amen? Amen. Amen. Um, but things didn't go as I had planned. You see, on the 12th week, after my surgery, I was really looking forward to it. You know, I'm one of those crazy patients that I mapped out like week after week, I'll post up, oh, what I can do, oh, one week after I can do it, two weeks after I can do it, three weeks after. By the time it was the 12th week, I was so excited because I told myself, 12 weeks is the mark that you can go back to all your pre-surgery activities. And the one thing I was really looking forward to was, you know, going back to the gym and feeling like I was normal again. I could do things that I like to do. But guess what? On the 12th, exactly the 12th week post-surgery, I had surgery on a Thursday and it was a Thursday, I went for physiotherapy. 
And I listened to my physiotherapist. I told her, I said, you know, I feel very deconditioned. <laughs> you know, it's been like three months, right? And she said, don't worry, I'm going to put you something very low impact. It's just to help you get back to where you were. And out of the blue, in the middle of the exercise, I told her, I don't think I can finish this. And she said, just continue. It's very low impact. It will be fine. The next day, my friends, I was in excruciating pain. The following Monday, I went to see a friend of mine who is an orthopedic surgeon. And he did an MRI, and they found that during that session, my left knee meniscus was torn. Friends, I don't know about you, whether you can feel my, the anguish that I went through, but it was very painful for me. I told the Lord, I thought I had been faithful. I have listened to everything that you have told me. And I told the Lord, I am very certain that this was not coincidence. And yet, I don't understand what you're doing. When I actually went through that, I thought about Abraham. I thought about how God had straightened my back through the inward straightening of my heart. You see, post-surgery, 12 weeks post-surgery, the funny thing was, I thought about the vision that the lady had spoken over my life. And she said this, you were once curled up, but you were standing tall with a sword. And I think to myself, God, is that sword the sword that Abraham held? And the funny thing is, do you know that throughout the entire surgery and post-surgery when I had pain, the only position that I could get any form of pain relief from was when I stood like this. <laughs> so the Lord corrected my spine physically through helping me burn away the dross in my life inwardly. And as you know, God is more concerned about what He does deep in our hearts. So when my knee was ruined, and those of you who have had sports injuries and things like that before, you know that the meniscus is not an easy part of the body to heal. That afternoon, I was so shook up. I already thought I had delayed our trip to Tanzania, you know, because of my spine. And now, what about this? The first two surgeons I met said, you definitely need surgery right away, as soon as possible. And I was so freaked out. I said, God, I don't know what you're doing. I can't, I, I, I don't want to go for surgery again. And you, I thought the spine surgery was bad, but this one was worse because this one would put me on braces and crutches for six weeks. And I'm like, at least the spine, one, I can move, I can, I can serve my children. But this would totally immobilize me. And I told the Lord, I cannot. And this was how good God was. He said, I felt him tell me this. Why don't you just take it slow? Take it easy, go for physiotherapy. And I went for physiotherapy, not the same physio. I definitely changed physios by then. So I went to a different physiotherapist and I actually got better. And by the time I went back to the knee surgeon, he was like, oh, you don't have symptoms. You have other symptoms, but it's not symptoms related to the tear. And I looked at him and I thought he would be very encouraging. But he said, I hope there are no orthopedic surgeons listening to this right now. But he said, Oh, I guess it's because you've reduced your activity level, but once it goes back up, you'll need surgery and you can look for me anytime. Not very encouraging. So those of you who are in allied health, you know physiotherapists are way more encouraging sometimes. And she was like, you're doing very well and I'm sure you'll progress well. But the short and long of the matter is this, I still live today in uncertainty about how my knee's going to fare. Every few weeks, I go back to the doctor and he's going to reassess to see if I need surgery. And at this point, I'm thinking to myself, God, like, did my laying down, my first laying down of exercise or of being, you know, mobile or whatever, did it not mean anything? Why are you doing this again? And I felt the Lord tell me, I'm in control. And this was to purge any remaining enslavement I had to the person I wanted to be. And I know what you're thinking, friends, you're like, how can you paint God to be so mean and harsh? But that is exactly what I'm not saying. I'm saying that when we don't understand God, it's okay. And that when we don't understand what He's doing with our lives, we can go to Him and say, God, show me. And I don't have the answers for you. I don't have the perfect theology of suffering for you. But I know this, that as we embrace what God has given to us in every season, that things will be okay. 
Because God is the primary one that we need. Amen? Amen. I'm going to go to the next slide. Um, when God gives you a vision, the question I want to ask all of us is, are you willing to take the agonizing walk up the mountain? Because the agonizing walk through three days, through up the mountain, is really the question that I want to ask all of us. If God takes away what you love the most, are you ready? Are you ready? And at the beginning of a new year, I feel this is a crucial question. The second question is, will you wrestle with what he's imparting to you? Because when I had my knee injury, I told the Lord, I said, Lord, give me a verse. Give me something from the Bible. I can't rely on the knee surgeon or the physiotherapist anymore. You have to show me. And he reminded me of, can you make a guess? Somebody who walked with a limp the rest of his life. Jacob, yes, let's go to the next slide. Jacob, now I'm not going to read through the whole thing, but the key is this, Genesis 32, if you look into it, Jacob wrestles with God. So the short story is this, Jacob, his name means usurper, heel grabber, someone who is always wanting to take things for himself. And maybe you feel, no, I'm not like Jacob. But friends, you and I both know that we love to hustle and strive and do things for ourselves. And that was what Jacob was. And one day, he actually wrestles with an angel. Many commentaries say that the angel is God himself, a man who revealed his face to Jacob when he wrestled with him. And what I want to encourage you to do is this, is if you don't understand what God is doing, wrestle with him. And suddenly it made sense to me that in my wrestling, God had put something out of joint in my body. And this is where I took comfort from. Let's go to the next slide. Genesis 32, the man asked him, what is your name? Jacob, he answered. And then the man said, your name will be no longer Jacob, but Israel, because you have struggled with God and with humans and have overcome. Your name will no longer be Jacob. Friends, when we wrestle with God, this is what happens. We get a new and fresh identity in our lives. And don't you want that more than anything else that you, you, you could ever exchange? Amen? Amen. Next slide. Hebrews 11.21, By faith, Jacob, when he was dying, blessed each of Joseph's sons and worshipped as he leaned on the top of his staff. Now, this image, friends, is very symbolic. You see, Jacob, as he was dying, he worshipped as he leaned on the top of his staff. Why did he do that? It's because his hip was out of joint. You see, through his wrestling with God, through his being given a new identity, through him living out the vision that God had given in his life, he had his hip put out of joint, but he received a posture of dependence and intimacy like no other, that till his dying day, he was still leaning on his staff. Friends, his staff representing a symbolism of his life's pilgrimage with God. What a powerful picture. Friends, do you want to be like Jacob? Do you want to exchange your old identity for a new one? If you want to, I want to embrace you to put your hearts in that posture because I want to call us to say yes to God today. I'm going to end off with my last slide. And it's this in Isaiah. Oh, it's not my last slide. It's the next slide. Um, I see you. Okay, let's... I'm going to tell you one last thing. Is that okay? Okay. So after I, my knee was injured, right, I was really angry. There were some nights I couldn't sleep. I felt like this wrong had been done unto me. And most of all, I felt that when I looked back at the sequence of events, it was due to professional negligence. And I told God, I said, God, I'm really wrestling. And there are a lot of well-meaning people who told me, why do you need to forgive and move on? But the one thing that I couldn't move on from was this, that if they could have done it to me, how about others? I met with them, talked with them, and there was this sense of, I didn't have closure. And I told God, I said, God, show me what it is that you want me to learn. But I need to know that you are with me. I need to know. And guess what? One day, I was at City Hall having coffee with a friend. I, I hardly ever go to City Hall. It's just not in my hood, you know? So I go all the way there. I meet a friend. I have coffee there. And then, a couple of hours later in the afternoon, someone contacts me through Instagram and says, Hello, Aisha. I saw you, uh, no, no, it's a couple of days later, I saw you last week 
at City Hall and I didn't want to come up and say hi because I was shy, but I just wanted to let you know I've been following what you've been going through and there is actually something you can do, which is mediation. Because you deserve to be compensated for what happened to you. And she says, I'm a lawyer, this is not my specialty, but I just want to put this before you so you have some sense of what you need to do next. I went home, I, I, I looked at Cliff, I said, Cliff, God has brought this person to me. If there is someone who's willing to fight for me, then I will take it as God defending me. But I will not do it myself. Because the lawyer or over Instagram kept saying, you can do it yourself and this is what you do. And I'm like, no, I don't want to do that. But guess what? When I went home, I told Cliff, I'm so encouraged because I felt the Holy Spirit download to me. I see you. And I want to encourage you today, friends, that if you're going through something that you don't understand, that is so bewildering and unfair and unjust, that God is saying, I see you. Because I told Cliff, how can God send someone? I don't even know this person. This person says she's my primary school friend. She was my pen pal. I don't even remember. And she's like, I promise you, I'm not an ambulance ch chaser. I'm not an IG stalker. I just really want to help you. And I'm like, I, I, if God sent her to see me at City Hall, which I like never go to, and I'm like, oh, you saw us sitting at, you know, Starbucks, is it? And she's like, no, I saw you at the train gantry. A few seconds walking through. I say, God, you really saw me. God sees you. And if you look in the Psalms, the Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. If you look at Chronicles, the eyes of the Lord search the whole earth in order to strengthen those who heart, whose hearts are fully committed to Him. He sees you, my friends. He sees you. And the last thing I want to end off with this is, let's go to Isaiah 43. Okay, when you don't understand God, Trust what he's doing with you. And Isaiah 45, 3 says this, I will give you the treasures of darkness and hidden riches of secret places that you may know that I, the Lord, who call you by your name, am the God of Israel. My friends, when you are in the dark, when you don't understand what God is doing, be sure of this, that he will reveal to you gems and hidden treasures which you would otherwise never see in the light. About a week and a half ago, I was walking in the morning. When I was better, I could start walking again. I, was, I, I, I like to walk before the sun gets up, before my kids get up. And while I was walking, you know, I always walk past this bird, this bird at the reservoir. And this bird is very annoying. You can walk so close to it and it doesn't move. And I'm like, what kind of silly bird is this? And I keep walking past it and it's always at the last moment when my toe is about to touch it, then it flies. I'm like, hello, you're a bird. You're supposed to fly when the moment you see me from afar, right? But no, this bird is always like this. And one day, I'm meditating on this verse and I see the bird. And for the first time, I don't try to like, hello. I actually look at the bird and I realize that it is a night jar. It is very rare. It's a black bird and it's this tiny gold speckled gems on it. And I said, God, you are speaking to me. This is the treasure of darkness that I've ignored for so long. And so I remember a week and a half ago when the lawyer, oh, I didn't finish the story about the lawyer. So a few hours later, the lawyer wrote back to me and she said, I'm sorry to sound schizophrenic, but I, I, I prayed to God and I spoke to my husband and the Lord told me that I will take up your case pro bono for you. And I said, God, you see me. You see me. Back to that night jar. That day, I remember, I was asking God, God, I need to know that you're with me, that I'm not doing or pursuing this out of my own will or whatever. And God, throughout all these bewildering things, when all our plans have been foiled, we were supposed to go to Tanzania like last year, why are we still here? Right? God revealed to me that He is real. I said, God, if you're so real, show me. Show me. the one. Okay, let me tell you this. God can speak to each of us very specifically. And if there's one way that He speaks to you, go to Him with that because He loves you. So for me, it's wildlife. Because you cannot, you know, even if you sit there and you say, I want to see a monkey. The monkey cannot just come out, you know. It's an act of God to me, at least to me. Okay, so anyway, that morning I woke up, I saw the night jar, I told God, God, reveal yourself to me. I saw the night, it's the first time I saw the night jar and a flying squirrel. Have you seen a flying squirrel before? It's very ugly. 
it's a colugo. It's got these huge bush baby eyes that are like protruding out. And then it's this ugly gliding skin. And then when it flies, it goes... And it flies from tree to tree. And I saw it in mid-flight. And I was like, God, this is surely a coincidence. So anyway, I keep meditating. I said, God, show me, show me. I need you to know, I need to know that you are real. Media team, please stand by that video. I'm going to end off with that video. And I say, God, I need to know you are real. And God knows I love endangered animals. Endangered animals. And that morning, I wake up, not the same day as the night jar day, not the flying squirrel, uh, flying squirrel day. It was a different day and I was walking. And this is what I saw. Can we share with everyone? Thank you. Can you see what it is? I was walking and I said, God, I need, to, I need to know that you speak to me in a very real way, in a way that only I can receive. Do you see it? It is the one and only Sunda Pangolin. It's a pangolin, my friends. Okay, you guys are not half as excited as me, but I am excited. <laughs> and it's because God knows that unique way that I'm wired, right? And in the same way, God knows how you are wired. So when you're going through the dark times, when you're going through difficulty, don't think that God is far away. He can speak to you in a very real way, whether it's a rainbow or whether it's somebody giving you a word or whether it's you discovering His word for yourself. I know some of you are like, wow, today uh, raining and the prawn me store still very short queue. God is with me. Even if you think that way and if God wants to speak to you that way because you are so specific, the way to your heart is through the prawn me then so let it be. You understand? Ah, now we're talking the same language. Okay. It's not the pangolin, it's the prawn me, right? <laughs> okay, but I want to close off the year with this. That friends, let's make a consecration today. As we sing this song, as, as, as we close, I want to invite all of us to stand. And for those of you, if you feel called, you say, God, I want to take the start of this year and I want to surrender my dreams to you. I want to learn how to dream bravely again. And those of you who, who want a copy of Dream Brave, um, it's up on the FaithWorks website or on Amazon. You can pre-order it. It will be out by the end of the month. And I pray that it will bless you. So let's sing together. Let's tell the Lord that we don't need anything else but God alone. We don't need anyone else. We don't need anyone else. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord.
would you give us the courage to consecrate all that we are to you? That Lord, at the end of the day, nothing else matters. Nothing else matters. Nothing else matters but you alone. So if that's you today, if you sense God is putting a nudge on your heart over something in your life, and you say, God, I want to consecrate this, I want to give it to you. I'm willing to go up the agonizing walk up, up the mountain. Would you get off your seats and come down? Because we want to just lay hands and pray for you and journey as you begin to the year. And for the rest of us, I'm going to dismiss you as the worshiping continues to sing the song. I just want all of us to pray. Thank you for watching. My hope is that every message on Kite Dreams will inspire you to dream bravely and live boldly for God. If you've been blessed by these messages, feel free to share them with your friends, subscribe, and I'd love to hear from you. May God grant you the courage and faith to pursue all that He has in store for you. Be blessed.